my name is Miranda Wayland. I'm the Head of Creative Diversity for the BBC. Uh, my focus is to look at all of our outputs, uh, so what our audiences sees, hears and reads. And it's about diversifying our production companies so that it can be more reflective in the content that they bring to us and the programmes they make for us. My name is Adi Rawcliffe. I'm Director of Creative Diversity at ITV and it's my job to work within the commissioning team primarily to drive representation on screen in terms of who's on screen um, and also in terms of who's making what's on screen. And I also have a slightly broader remit to work more generally and um, to drive people and encourage them to do more around this um, across the business. And I guess what we like to think of ourselves as is very much a mainstream popular broadcaster so it's what we it's about what we do in the heart of prime time in our biggest shows and we feel very strongly that everyone should see themselves reflected on itv and everyone should feel that they can work at itv and it's always been important for us to be able to reflect the diverse, diverse audiences that we want to portray in our content to make sure that we have production companies that are also diverse who are making those programs for us and so prior to, to lockdown and prior to COVID-19, that has always been a stable requirement of who and what we want to be known within the creative industry uh, and part of our broadcasting remit, it's part of our charter. So continuing to work collaboratively with all our broadcaster partners, ITV and everybody else, in terms of our relationship with the Creative Diversity Network, making sure that through reporting, monitoring, measuring, we have the tools and the premise to be able to identify and enhance where we see the efforts need to be made. We also is on train and continue to be to make sure that in terms of the conversations that we're having with our commissioners and our suppliers, they're robust, they're actionable, and they give us the outcome that we're looking for, but also to be able to support the industry to really understand and embed the value of diversity. Moving away from that silo conversation of diversity only being for, you know, you look at it in, in single strands. So we were really expanding that conversation around intersectionality and also looking to drive the disability agenda forward. So that's, that continues to be a big part of what we're hoping to, 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 to achieve going forward. Sort of similar to what Miranda talked about. I mean, we're we're slightly different because we're a commercial mainstream broadcaster. So for us, obviously, diversity and inclusion representation is absolutely something that we should do, and we're a public service broadcaster. But clearly, the commercial and the creative case is very important for us. I mean, we're in competition with Netflix, we're in competition with Amazon, we're in competition with Apple, and they are doing this stuff well. So if we don't keep up with them, then there people have now got a place to go. In the old days, as a public service broadcaster, you had a monopoly and there weren't all these competitors trying to sort of steal your lunch. So you could sort of, um, it, it just, the competition has intensified. And when audiences can get things elsewhere, if you're not providing that diversity of content and providing representation of people's lives and experiences, they will go elsewhere. I mean, when I was growing up, I always say this is that, and Miranda will be able to relate to this, is that if we saw people like us, it was a moment when we all crowded around the telly. Mm -hmm. But now our kids, if they're not seeing people like themselves, they ain't watching. And so mm. we were really aware of that. And that was sort of driving a lot of our processes. So what we tried to do is we tried to embed diversity and inclusion as part of our existing processes. So it became something that was discussed through our social partnership, commissioning commitments. It was discussed at the beginning of the commissioning process because it needs to be something that everyone's responsible for. And, you know, all the commissioning editors have performance related pay, so a bonus around what they achieve on screen and off screen around diversity and inclusion. So that's sort of where we were, but this has created a new level of urgency, expectation and accountability. And there's just a feeling of just ramping up this, uh, this whole agenda. And what I've been struck by personally is the demand and the speed required around change. My husband's a school teacher and he was getting emails saying, look, we want the curriculum changed by Monday as we're not coming into school. I mean, that's the sort of pace that people want. And I really feel, I feel the pressure and the weight of expectation mm. of that, but I'm also excited by the opportunity. It feels like a real re reset moment. And some of what we've been doing in the past has worked. Some of what we've been doing in the past hasn't worked as effectively as we wanted it to. So it's a moment to sort of reset and dial up the pace significantly, I would say. We were trying to understand about the pandemic and how that impacted us. We were, you know, anxious and concerned for loved ones and knowing that we couldn't necessarily connect with them. So 
television content had a place to be able to give reality, to be accurate in its reporting, both with BBC and ITV, took real pride in making sure that we were telling accurate news and informing a nation about what was impacting them. Then you put on top of that the murder of George Floyd and it became something that was visible to everyone. Everybody was around and watching it at the same time. And in that moment, I think a number of us were kind of like, okay, well, it's a horrific situation to witness, but actually racism and race, the whole conversation and topic is something that we're all familiar with because we've had to live it day in and day out as individuals, let alone what we do in the day job. What suddenly felt like had happened was that everyone understood the conversation we'd been having for a lifetime. And then that sparked this, oh, right, so what have you been talking about? Oh, that's still a thing? Oh, wow, and that just bleeds into everything. Oh, okay, I get it now. Everybody wanted to talk about it. Everybody wanted to understand it. Everyone wanted to be woke. Everybody wanted this sense of urgency for change. And as a broadcaster, you have a duty of responsibility not only to, to reflect back what the nation is experiencing and seeing, whether it's through your storytelling, whether or not it's through your news outlet, but also as an organisation to understand the impact it has for the people working there. So it didn't just impact black people, it impacted everybody in a way that, you know, you've seen in various times in life where those particular moments start to create a shift. But with social media, people coming together globally, standing together as one, marching together, having their voice heard, having an expectation and a demand, and for us to be able to respond to that, that then, cat that catalyst meant that there was a sense of expedience that, you know, Andy was talking about earlier. In COVID lockdown, the pandemic was really traumatic for lots of people and lots of people were personally affected by it as well. And I think it started to highlight inequality in our country, different, different experiences around race, around income, around geographical location. So already that was starting to sort of tease those out. We're all watching those images every day. And then sort of layer on top of that, Black Lives Matter. And like, you know, Miranda said, because of the pandemic, we're much more engaged and we're all watching much more content. And everything just felt, I mean, I don't know how you fight, but I felt completely overwhelmed by it all. Mm. And it was, you know, we were all exhausted, we were devastated. Mm. And so this all came together to create this moment when people were just sort of saying, enough is enough. We yeah. need to talk about change now. And I also think a lot of the conversations that you can have as a black person in an organization um, that you have kept internalized because you've gone, oh my goodness, maybe I'm imagining it, or that didn't really happen to me. People started to have those conversations outwardly and you know in our organization people were emailing those conversations to the ceo and so i think it led to an honesty that we haven't mm. seen and i was really i was particularly devastated by how many stories came out from actually quite famous people of things that had happened to them five six seven eight years ago that they've had to carry with them and now was the moment that they could come up with, you know come out with them and i guess one of the things that i really hope happens is that now when those things happen the microaggressions the racism things that happen to people i want them to be able to call it out at the moment yeah. and i also want other people who see themselves as allies to also call it out it's not just down to the black person it's not just down to the asian person it's not just down to the disabled person we all have to call these out because in order to bring about change we all need to get involved and actively bring about that change and I think Andy's right. That's that's been if there's been anything positive to come out of that is that underrepresented groups feel empowered to talk the truth to their experience. You know, there was a time that they had to, you know, if you were talking about race or if you're talking about anything, you almost had to document everything, kit and caboodle about what the experience was was like and what happened and when it happened and all that kind of stuff. Now when we talk about it, there is a much more deeper understanding which in of itself creates a really greater environment, as, as complexing as it can be sometimes for people to be able to have a conversation around race, but it means that people are listening in a way that they're no longer being defensive about it, or no longer asking you to go deep dive into your experience to get that level of understanding. I can turn around and say, I have witnessed or I've seen or I've experienced racism, and people get it because they now had that moment of eight minutes and 49 seconds where they saw it for themselves. And that has to be, if nothing else, has to be something that we can't let go and let's slip back to where we came from. And I know that Addie and I are both passionate to make sure that, that 
opportunity where people can actually feel comfortable, not feel that there's going to be retribution if they speak up, am I going to lose my job? Is my job, you know, my progression suddenly stalled because I vocalized how I felt? That, that's not something we're interested in falling back into. ITVs and their acceleration program, I have to applaud it because it's absolutely phenomenal because what that does in terms of what we're doing, what ITV is doing and what the other broadcasters are doing, to be fair, you know, we've all come out with our different stance and our positioning, is that you're creating an industry of equality and opportunity. Number one thing, people want to have the opportunity to work in our industry. We don't have as many opportunities as we have people of interest. But what you want to do is make sure that those opportunities are visible and accessible. And so with the acceleration program, with our 20% target, with Viacom turning around and saying, you know, no diversity, no permission, it means that people have real hope and they can see those opportunities for what they really are. So I'm really excited at a time when, you know, we've talked about targets, we've done initiatives, all of which has helped us to get to where we are today. This collaborative approach within our sector, where individually as broadcasters, we've seen what we needed, we've understood how to set that in motion to be able to get us to where we want to be, coupled with what we're all doing collectively, has meant that for the recipients of that, it is the most powerful position that we have been able to give our sector for a while. And I'm excited about the journey, the work that we need to do to make sure we can monitor it, measure it, and continue to hold ourselves to account. I'm looking forward to coming back in a year's time with you, David, and going, oh my God, look what we did in that year. And to celebrate some of the content and the production companies we've worked with, the stories that we told, the appointments that we've made. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that particular aspect as much as I am about the fact that, you know, irrespective of who we are as broadcasters, the one thing we are aligned with is the importance of representation from top to bottom. So to Miranda's point as well, is that it's not a zero sum game. So we all no. benefit from people investing in this space because we're an industry. So, you know, people, you know, Greenacre who made unsaid stories for us might make a show for the BBC tomorrow. And so we all benefit from investment. You know, Miranda, Miranda's announced a hundred million for, you know, diversity in production companies. Those companies will then come to work for ITV. So we all benefit from investment in this sector. And I think that, you know, Miranda and I do it anyway, but, and you know, with lots of other people, but, we have to work collaboratively as well because we're trying to shift an industry, a society. That's how big what we're trying to do. And actually just trying to do that by yourself is quite a big thing to do. Mm. But I guess from a sort of ITV point of view is that what we've tried to do in our acceleration plan is just build some accountability, look at things from sort of senior level, we're going to make an appointment onto the management board, to key commissioning roles, to key roles in studios, look at that sort of level, but also look at our talent pipeline. So mm. how we're, people are accessing the industry from all different and underrepresented groups, from you know black backgrounds, Asian backgrounds, disabled people, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, how they're coming in. Um, so we're looking at that. And then obviously for us, as you know, just like the BBC, there's a really big on-screen piece as well, because mm. I think a lot of people haven't felt included by our content. So we have to work harder on that. And we've, as I said, we did Unsaid Stories, which was a direct response to um, the Black Lives Matter movement, but we did isolation stories earlier. And so again, these sort of innovative programs that we've turned around in four weeks. And it's sort of like, you know, what's that saying about, you know, the mother of invention is hardship or something. I don't yeah. know if you quoted it quite right. But one of the things I've been really struck by is as an industry, when people have to do things differently, we can adapt and we oh, can yeah. do it. And so we've had to do this with COVID, we've had to do this with working from home, and now is the moment we've got to do this with diversity and inclusion, because yeah. now is when we've just got to get on with it. The talking's been done, yeah. and I sort of, I, I don't want us to get into an arms race of initiatives with all the broadcasters. What We'll all be judged by what we do, not what we say we're going to do. And mm. there's lots of people that have sort of heard this all before. And the only thing that will make people be, feel confident that we're going to be able to bring about this change is when they start to see it. And that's yeah. what I'm excited about.
I worry about lots of things, honestly. I mean, honestly, people like Miranda are a lifeline because when you're in the positions of responsibility that we're in, to be able to have a peer that you can sort of compare notes with and also be emotionally supportive to each other is really, really helpful, even though we work for different broadcasters. And, you know, Miranda used to work at ITV. I used to work at Channel 4. So we've had this relationship going on for far too long. Um, but the, <laughs> things, the things that are, keep me awake at night are keeping momentum going, because mm. I don't want this to be a moment. This has to keep going. And also the great burden of responsibility for change. At the height of when these things are happening, being the only person in the room or being one of the few people in the room and having to carry the weight of responsibility for all our people can be exhausting. And so that's something that we can share and which is helpful to be able to compare notes about. Yeah, I would totally echo all of that. I think the things that keep me awake equally is am I doing enough for the other represented groups? When people look at me, and I don't know if Andy feels the same, but I think what they see automatically is a black person. And it's very hard for them to move away and see a black woman and to talk about female issues. So I'm always very conscious, am I doing enough to be able to push the other underrepresented groups when all very often all you want to talk to me about is about race and about ethnic diversity and all that kind of stuff. So that that I always feel, and that's a personal battle that I've, I've had ever since I joined this particular career is, are people seeing more of me than the initial first look of me? And then I think the other thing that I often wrestle with, again, is how do I get this so it doesn't just become outsourced 0800 diversity? There was a time where it was like, okay, there's a diversity issue called the diversity team. Are we doing enough so it gets woven into the fabric of business as usual? And, you know, how much more could there be done? How much do I need to step up and go, no, actually, you've got the tools. You know how to do it. We can take the training wheels off. Don't worry, I'm not going to let you fall. Now run with that. Do you know what I mean? Because it can be, the wonderful thing about diversity is everybody understands and says yes to it. Everybody understands what inclusion means. But everybody sometimes feels not within their gift to be able to achieve the very thing that they would like to achieve or they need to outsource it to other people so it's really getting the industry to a place where it can be stable enough so we can keep moving forward and that often keeps me going right Addy, how do we do this <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think as well you know sort of building on miranda's point as well as that i think it's about how you build it into everyone's roles but it has to be an individual responsibility for everyone in the yeah. business it's not something that someone else can do it the analogy i often use is a bit like climate change if miranda and i were climate change monitors but we were the only people who were recycling and everyone else was going around in 15 litre cars and ignoring recycling we wouldn't make much difference so mm. what we have to do is empower others so that they do and bring about the change themselves and i think a lot of the challenge around this space is everyone's thought someone else is going to do it no yeah. no someone else isn't going to do it yeah. you've got to do it if you want to bring about the change so i think that's really important and i think the thing about you know competing interests and things like that around diversity i think that's a bit of a myth so for example mm. i used to work at channel four and we did the paralympics and we took a whole disabled production team uh, over to rio and because of that we had to be very specific about what time, because people had various different needs, what time people started and what time people finished their shift. So we all benefited from that. We all collectively benefited from that because we all knew what time we we're going to start and we all knew we were going to finish. And I think that actually, if you are inclusive, Mm. generally i think it benefits everybody i think you know there's a the great one about the shopping trolleys we all use which is much shallower those are that that's the one that that was originally designed for disabled people now we all use those trolleys so i think there's a lot to be gained by being inclusive of a certain group but that would still spill over to general inclusivity in my experience yeah i think in relation to where we are today and what the future would look like for success for me we as Eddie mentioned we we stipulated the 100 million spend I would like us to be able to come back and demonstrate that not only have we successfully spent that and created and worked with diverse talent and made diverse content, that actually we decided to raise our game and to add more than just the 100 million. It became the starting point for something bigger and better. I'd love us to be able to be in a position, David, that you call back and you actually sit in front of us and go, all that stuff that in you can roll it off your tongue because it's so organic. It's so memorable and it's so, it's so game-changing that actually it doesn't need Addy and I to demonstrate and talk about it. People are talking about it because of its own individual success. 
And I think more importantly, I want us to be able to be in a position where our industry can no longer say that A, it doesn't know where diverse talent is, they don't know where to source it, they don't know where to find it, and they still consider it to be a risk. If, if two years from now, we truly are able to demonstrate and to organically talk about diverse representation, both off screen and off screen, just being the fabric of who we are, not in a risk, not in a scheme, not in an initiative, then I feel I would have done a good job in two years. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, similar. I mean, I think that, I mean, I used to always say this and I failed, but I used to always say that I wanted to work myself out of a job and I seem mm. to not being able to do that. Um, but so that would be a, a sign of success, but more specifically and more seriously, I guess that I am really interested in what happens in mainstream television when you accurately reflect the diversity of modern Britain. I'm interested in what Shonda, you know, what is the British Shonda Rhimes? How do you do that at mainstream prime time television in a really successful way where the creators are diverse and all that sort of stuff? I think that's a really brilliant opportunity because I don't think anyone's quite nailed that. So I'd like to see us being closer to that. Um, so there's that. And obviously I would like to walk, go on set and see a better representation in all our crews out on, you know, people working behind the camera. Um, I'd like people who feel they haven't been given the opportunities to feel like they are better able to have them. But also on a really personal level, at ITV, I would like everyone to feel we work in an inclusive culture and that everyone is equal and everyone has equality of opportunity. I think that really matters that people feel that they are equally included and have equal opportunities. Mm -hmm.